Welcome to another edition of the Energy Week podcast. Ryan Ray, alongside the one and only Dr. Energy herself, Ellen Wald. Ellen, how's it going? Everything's fantastic. No, it's not, Ellen. No, it's really not. <laughs> okay, so first off, since we last talked, our beloved uh, Celtics lost oh. on a last-second shot to your hero, um, Rajon Rondo, which crushed me. Um, oh, and then, then they just gacked up a lead to the to the Clippers. Like, it was it 28 points on Saturday or Sunday? I can't remember what it was. Uh, it was like, oh, man. It was Saturday night. Saturday night. That's what it was. Uh, Brad Stevens needs to – Brad Stevens is the coach of the Boston Celtics, for those who don't follow Celtics basketball quite as uh, um, – specifically as Ryan and I do, but he really needs to explain what is going on in the third quarter because yeah. they like get these big leads and they just blow them. And it's, I don't know. I can't. Yeah, it was, it. it was a long week for a Celtics fan. And, you know, I, I'm wondering, and we will get off this quickly, but I'm wondering, you know, they had all that success last year after all the players got hurt, Hayward and Kyrie. And I'm like, you know, all those backups kind of rose to the, the challenge. And I, I wondered if that's caught a little, a little, a little turmoil this year, you know, because the twos are thinking, hey, you know what? We were pretty good as ones last year, so I'm wondering if that's uh, yeah. a point of contention. Uh, and, yeah, it's it's kind of disappointing to see this happening because you know that they have much better – they're not playing up to their potential. Yep, I know. Speaking of not living up to his potential, <laughs> let's talk about Tesla. Um, from Forbes, will Tesla's latest price cut on the Model 3s entice buyers – a senior contributor to Forbes, Ellen Wall, wrote this piece. Ellen, we'll just go to you directly for the answer. Will it? Probably not. So what's really interesting about their decision to cut prices on the Model 3 is that this is a direct response to the fact that the government is cutting its tax credits for the Tesla Model 3. So the government cut back on the tax credits, and now Tesla's decided they're going to cut the price to uh, try to entice buyers. And And I'm, I was accused by someone on a social media platform of confusing causation and correlation. But mm-hmm. Tesla actually said in its on its website, like in a press release, that this is why they were cutting the price. So I really don't think that I'm confusing causation and correlation here. But w- what's interesting, I think, about about this is that it really shows that these government tax credits are basically pouring money into the company. They're not really designed for the consumer because if the tax credits hadn't been there, then Tesla would have been priced at a price. Presumably the cars would have been priced at, you know, where the market thought that consumers would purchase them. And so clearly that price is lower than they were selling at. And so basically the tax credit was like a kickback to the company, not an incentive, you know, not not designed to really help the consumer per se, and uh, you know, I think that that's that's something we need to keep in mind when we look at how governments try to incentivize particular policy. And when you look at it as a tax credit, it's not really for the consumer; it's not really for the taxpayer. It's going to the company. So let me make sure I understand this correct. Let's just use the flat number of fifty thousand here. So the the Tesla was selling for fifty thousand. They had a tax credit for was it seventy five hundred dollars? That's something like that. So let's say seven thousand. So you could get it after you purchase it for forty three thousand. And what you're saying is is that when the tax credit rolled away, Tesla began selling them now again. Just use even numbers and easy math. Forty three thousand dollars, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if Tesla's sales were struggling, why wouldn't they have reduced the price sooner, and people would have got the tax credit? Exactly. So, because it's not for the consumer. <laughs> it's for the company. Besides Elon, maybe this is Elon. Why is Elon's company the one that gets the most credit here or the most scrutiny? Because we talked about, um, was it two weeks ago, the polar vortex or whatever it was. And, you know, well, no, actually, we, we talked last week and the recording died on us. So there's the, the lost archives there. Um, we did talk last week, me and you did, but by ourselves, um, about <laughs> about the impact of the polar vortex on the electric vehicles. Um, and, and they kind of got a lot of bad press, and our comments was, well, yeah, we're, we're not really surprised based upon how every other battery performs in really cold weather. Um, it's 
it feels it feels like there's still a hard sell for most of the country because unless you fit in a very near a narrow demographic, um, this EV just probably doesn't work for you. Yeah, and it it really doesn't. I mean, you've got to have either some other form of transportation. Like you, it, it's not working. And cutting the price on the Model Three, I don't think will necessarily attract more buyers because for them. It was. It's. It's. It's just taking away the price increase that the lack of the federal tax credit was was ha- was was bringing, and I don't think that it's really going to make it more affordable for people. If EVs were really cheap, like we're talking like less than buying, say, a used internal combustion car, if they were really cheap, then I bet you'd get a lot of people saying, hmm, I could do this for my second car that I'm going to just drive around, you know, the neighborhood, I'm going to do my errands, I'm going to pick up the kids from school, I'm going to go to the park, I'm going to, you know, the things that you do every day. But, you know, if you can afford to have a vehicle that's really expressly for that purpose, but, you know, when push comes to shove and you want to go, like, you know, visit grandma, 200 miles away who doesn't have an EV charging uh, charger in her garage, then, you know, you're not going to take that car. Right. And on top of that, if you say, well, if you look at technology in general, you kind of have this early adopter deal where people are the early adopters and they're the one out there trying it. It doesn't feel like there's enough market penetration for the masses to ask people, like, if I wanted to know not what the internet says, but I just wanted to ask someone about a Ford truck, well, obviously I can go next door and find out about a Ford truck. If I want to find out about a Tesla, uh, the person who sold us our house uh, here in Texas had a Tesla, so I could go ask her, but I don't know her that well. And so you, you start trying to say, well, how do you find out, you know, like you're saying, these scenarios and questions. And this is the stuff that you want to ask people. There's just not enough market penetration to kind of feel comfortable with them as well. I think I think that's part of the problem, too. Yeah, and, and I think, and you know, people who you talk to someone, I was talking to someone a couple, a couple months ago who has a Tesla who loves it, but he doesn't drive it very far. And you know, he says, I love it. It's great. It's fantastic. I'm sure it's like lovely to be in or, or whatever. It's a great, you know, rider experience, but you know, it's, it's, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to fit everyone's needs and you know different people have different needs when it comes to buying a car and so it's just it's i find it very disconcerting and and i noticed this particularly with some of the super bowl commercials that we saw during during the super bowl you know a lot of a lot of car commercials and you have you know a uh, i can't remember i think it was audi advertising that a third of all model of all of their cars are going to be electric vehicles by, I don't know, 2025 or 2023. I, I don't remember which one. And, and they're saying this, like that's going to be like some great thing that's going to entice people to buy their cars. It just didn't seem to, to me to be something that would be applicable to most people, most consumers who are watching the Super Bowl. But, you know, if you, so I do think that there is kind of a niche market for EVs, like particularly like in turn, maybe, you know, certain kind of taxi services within cities, because if you're not driving long distances and you can afford to like, you know, charge it up all the time uh, and cities that have a lot of smog, it could be a great way to reduce smog. It's still, however, a very expensive proposition because these cars are not cheaper than internal combustion engines. Yeah, and and, and uh, cars are expensive as it is. We're just looking at buying a new car the other day, and it's like, oh man, you could almost oh, buy a, a rental insane. property for <laughs> for that. Oh yeah, no, buying a new it's absolutely insane today to buy buy new cars. They're so expensive, and then and then it's not even thinking about okay, these EVs haven't been along the way. What's going to happen when you need to change the battery? Right, that mm-hmm. will happen. What, what, what do you do? You, like, this is a huge, giant battery. First of all, where is that battery going to go? You don't just like take it to the dump. No, yeah, there's all kinds of things. Yep, spare parts and yeah, you know, lot, lot of long way to go before they uh, so. they figure out what to do there. Okay, let's turn now to Reuters. Latin America oil prices flows to U.S. jump amid PDBSA restrictions. Been a lot of talk about Venezuela. We talked about some last week. Uh, you know, I think last week I had the brilliant idea on how to fix Venezuela's problems, and it got lost. <laughs> oh no, you're right. It's yeah, it had to do. You know, I actually remembered it because I I was talking about it. We, I, I I couldn't get it out of my head because I thought it was such a great idea. Your your idea was um, it had to do with returning 
like subsoil mineral rights to people, to, to the, the people, not, not making them government owned. And so individuals can then, you know, if they own land and they own subsoil uh, rights to the oil and they can then lease it to, mm-hmm. you know, whatever company or, or, or pride rights to it is, is developing it. And then the money that they are getting from that will then, you know, they can use that, you know, start businesses or, or whatever and, and so on and so forth. And that will bring more economic prosperity. It's a great way to make sure that the money from developing oil just doesn't go into the government coffers, but actually goes to the economic, um, uh, to, to, to the, this recovery the country, the economic, uh, you know, the engagement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was yeah. your idea. That was, no, oh, I, I wish it was my, my original idea, but I just took what we do in America and said, why don't you, why don't you try that down here? So <laughs> it's, I didn't create a new model, I, but I do think it would be very helpful. But, um, so yeah, there's a lot of talk. I know we have another piece, I think, later on as well about what's going on here with the PDVSA, Venezuela. Let's kind of dive into this. Um, what's kind of going on, and w- is there a sign of relief in the near future? So everyone's concerned. You know, Venezuela produces this very heavy oil that certain refineries really need, and so now that Venezuela is not a source for that oil anymore, where are they getting their oil from? And, and I was concerned initially when when this got started that, say, Citgo, which is basically a, a subsidiary, is a subsidiary of uh, PDVSA, that do they have contracts that only you know that I was saying perhaps they have actual contracts that only allow them to import oil from. PDVSA and, you know, or do Sitco stations, you know, gasoline stations only allow them to, to sell gasoline produced by Sitco. And, and none of this was very clear. So this article kind of sheds a little bit more light on how the, the changes in kind of global oil shipments that are going on because of the sanctions on Venezuela. So apparently oil producers in Colombia, Ecuador, and Brazil are all benefiting because um, they are kind of coming in to supply these refineries with oil. So I know they said Citgo actually arranged to import oil from Colombia recently uh, to make up for the lack of um you know, of oil from Venezuela. And, and it's kind of interesting because all of a sudden everyone is very, very focused on all the different types of crude oil. You know, as before it was like, oh, there's WTI, there's Brent, there's light oil, there's heavy oil. Now it's like, we're all learning these very specific names. So it says um, that Valero Energy, which uh, also used to import from Venezuela, is now getting uh, about 500,000 barrels of um, uh a, a blend of oil from Colombia called Castilla blend. I did not know that there's a Castilla blend, but now uh, the, that um, now that, that everybody wants this oil or they're looking for substitutes to Venezuela's oil, the prices on very specific types of oil are now going up. Uh, but it doesn't, it seems to be affecting crude prices just a little bit. It says U S crude prices edged up about 5%, 5 cents, sorry, not 5%. 5% would be a huge amount, 5 yeah. cents on a barrel on Friday, which really is not that much. So, you know, one of the things that I, and, and I know we have some folks that mean you know personally, but I would love to get someone on here just to kind of talk about this, is there was an article from Bloomberg the other day that someone tagged me in about the different blends and, and you know, um, the, the need to blend them. But what I don't, I guess where I kind of get lost on is if you look at Exxon and Chevron, both announced, I think Chevron's buying up facility here in the U.S. or in Mexico, I can't remember. Um, and then Exxon's expanding one of their plants, refineries, um, to incorporate more of this lights recrude we have here in the United States. And so where I kind of get lost on this discussion is I understand right now we need to blend the oil. But my question is, is, is that a forever thing? Because it seems like the producers, um, not the producers, the refining companies are expanding their capacity for light sweet crude. Um, and you could say, well, we expect the demand for oil to go up, and so we need 10% light sweet crude, and so we're just got to expand to accommodate more um, more oil in general, which it only includes 10% light sweet crude. But, but it feels like, and maybe I'm missing this, but it feels like there's a sense where there's going to be more light sweet crude used so long term, will we need these heavy crudes? And I don't really understand. I don't really fully have a, a good grasp on where it's heading, but I don't really get there's a, a consensus in that debate either. Yeah. So I actually asked. Um, it's, it's a great question, and, and I've been wondering this too. So I actually talked to uh, one of the guys who works at the uh, EIA, um, 
we chatted on, you know, direct message on Twitter a little bit about the different uh, blends of oil. And he's saying that, so there are some things that we produce that you really do want this, he called it heavy sludgy oil, um, Mm -hmm. that they really do want like asphalt, Mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Apparently that's, that's what you got to use. So there are certain plants that really, really rely on this stuff and that's not going to change. So we're still going to have some demand for this kind of stuff from, you know, from, from, to make certain products. Uh, To me, it almost seems like if the oil is available, there'll still be a demand for it. So even if we're switching more to process the light sweet crude, which I think is is probably best, particularly for the United States, because we seem to certainly be producing a lot of that light crude oil. But you know, if Venezuela and Canada are going to offer that crude for sale, I think there will always be people who will buy it. With Venezuela, the way I understand the issue is that it's so heavy and so sludgy that they can't even get it to really move through the pipelines without Mm -hmm. these upgrader units and without mixing it with all this other stuff. And so it could be that the entire Venezuelan oil industry will grind to a halt if their upgrader units start to fail, which they are starting to fail. If their upgrader units fail and they can't get any of these diluents that they've been importing from the U.S. Right. So my, my question to that would be is, okay, so let's take the asphalt example. And again, I don't know anything about this. This is how I would think about it. I'd say, okay, so historically we've had an access to this heavy crude, and we know that it works well for the sludge oil, as you call it. It works well for using asphalt. Um, but now that we know we have access to light sweet crude, will people sit down and go, you know what, before... So is it a matter of before we didn't have um, access to as much light sweet crude, so people didn't try to use it to develop this as the asphalt. Asphalt, because they knew we had excess or a lot of um, capacity to bring in the heavy oil. So now that we have the access to light sweet crude, will people go in there and say, well, you know what? We've got this light sweet crude. We can bring it in. We can bring it from overseas, da 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 And can we make, can we now make asphalt? And that's, and so, um, because sometimes, like, the asphalt, just to use that, it may be where only the heavy oil chemically can, can work with it. Or is it a matter of, well, we just haven't done enough testing to try it with a lighter a lighter crude, um, but in theory it could be. And that's kind of where, so I get what they're saying. I guess I'm just curious. Look, you know, we, we, we develop all kinds of stuff that we said, well, we couldn't do that, now we can do it. So I'm, I'm just, that's where I'm always curious in these debates, how much of this is really set in stone and how much of it is really just based upon we've developed to, to build out certain things because of what the supply was before. But sometimes if we put in all of this, this investment into it, people will be very, very hesitant to let go. Right. No, exactly. Exactly. So, and I I mean, I would guess like if we're not going to use it, somebody else will like China or India. I mean, the the price could plummet. I mean, we could, I mean, already, like if you looked, I mean, like the prices on, um, on Western Canadian select and and on, we're already like so much lower than, Mm. um, you know, than, than oil prices ever. You could, I wonder though, if this trend continues in refining, if we will just see, it, it will almost be like, maybe we shouldn't even call it oil. <laughs> like maybe it should be treated as, as something else specific because the price differential will be so great that, you know, it will be like, well, Brent went up this much or w went, WTI went up this much, but, you know, that other stuff that is kind of like oil is, you know, still $2 a barrel. <laughs> Yeah, we need to get the head of refining for Chevron or Exxon or someone or Shell. Yeah. Come, come on the show. Well, yeah, come on. Let's ask us all these questions that we fully don't understand. So one more article. We have Dr. Foreman coming on. So one more article. Um, the first time I ever heard this company's name, I called them Total, which is a total mistake. Total makes big offshore oil discovery in South Africa. Uh, this has kind of been hitting the newswire um, to you know past couple of days. And, um, you know, they have some onshore natural gas stuff down there, I know, but I don't, I don't know when was, you know, when all this came about. Obviously, recently, but this is going to be potentially big news for South Africa, because um, if you go back to during the apartheid time period, there was a time when OPEC would not sell them all, and so um, now that is so interesting that I did not know OPEC wouldn't sell South Africa oil because of apartheid. Hmm. That's my understanding. I, that I, I, is so interesting. I, I will tell you the story that I was told offline because um, I, 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 I was <laughs> I'm not at liberty to, to tell you online, but I will tell you what I told. I tell you the story I told offline, and um, 
we we could we can talk about it there. But yeah, that's my understanding at least. But um, big for South Africa, and you know, South Africa oh. is a, a great place to be, and hopefully, it's um, you know, bring some economic stimulus down there because they could probably use it. Yeah, I just I just it'll be curious to see what model they choose you know to basically develop these are they just going to lease it to you know the companies that discovered it are they going to form some sort of national oil company to go in with it you know i think it'll be interesting uh to to see what they how they decide to to do this um speaking though of mispronouncing total so um way back when when i was doing my research for my dissertation um I was researching a company called, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce this name because I cannot speak French for my life, but the, um, uh, it was called CFP. It was basically like French Petroleum Company. Mm-hmm. And so it took me over. <laughs> I, so I kept talking about CFP, CFP, and at some point CFP changed their name to Total. But I didn't know that for quite some time. <laughs> so I kept calling it CFP and people were like, what? What are you talking about? Like, CFP, you know, the French word comes like total. <laughs> like, yeah, my knowledge of this stuff stops in, you know, like 1960. So. <laughs> well, my first experience was Chesapeake sold some of their Barnett, ass- Barnett assets to them, like, I don't know, five, ten years ago. And I thought, oh, okay, Chesapeake sold a total. Good for them, you know. And I was just talking <laughs> to someone, and I just kind of mentioned that, and some French company, yada, yada, yada. And then, like, you know, a few weeks or months later, I heard it pronounced so tall. I was like, ah, I just hope those people didn't know <laughs> because they didn't say anything. And I was like, oh, I felt like an idiot. But, you know, they do have, to your point about South Africa, they do have a company down there, South Sol, Um, I don't know if they have offshore camp capacity. I'm trying to look and see. They're building a big, South Sol is building a big refinery down in, Lake Charles, Louisiana. It's probably built by now. I know they're looking on one, but I don't know if they have offshore capacity, so I had to look that up because that's a good point. They may get Sassol to partner in. Um, Sassol will obviously partner on some level, but how much, I don't know. That's a good point. Yeah, it, it, it could be really, really interesting here. I mean, it's it, it's also a good reminder that we have this idea in our minds of like certain countries are oil producers and certain countries are oil consumers. Mm-hmm. And that's not necessarily always going to be the way it is. I mean, the United States was a huge oil producer then kind of was dropping off there for a while and now is, is reversing the trend. And so that's, that's one reason why I always say that, you know, it's like this idea of peak oil. Well, we are always discovering more because there are new ways of discovering it, new ways of, of, of you know getting oil that we previously thought was really unaccessible out of the ground and, and it can make countries and it can really change the entire trajectory of a country but of course it depends how they how they deal with it and, and how they use that and and there are a lot of different models for this i mean you know you can go the national oil company way you can go norway's way um i've looked into a little bit of how israel is dealing with its new natural gas resources and they had some se- i mean talk about like regulatory hurdles i mean like some of these regulatory hurdles they, i mean they just stymied their own production for like <laughs> a year right. or two because of their insane regulations and once again for well i guess it's like four or five months in a row now we have on dr dean foreman with the American Petroleum Institute. We're going over the month, the monthly statistical report that they put out. And uh, Dr. Foreman, it's good to have you on. Thank you. And let's kind of go over the executive summary of this month's report. Okay, great. Thanks for having me. Um, so I was looking at it, and I always like to kind of start at the top here. It makes it easy for us. And then just for everyone's point of reference, this will be out on February 14th, just in time for that special Valentine's Day gift that you're getting for a loved one um, <laughs> <laughs> to sit down. Um, the first he says, one, I love you, like <laughs> the monthly statistical report from API. Exactly. <laughs> so while people are having steak and wine at Valentine's, they're going to be talking about the strongest gasoline demand, 8.9 million barrels per day for the month of January on record since 1945. So I've got two questions there. Do we go back did the records go back to before 1945 or is this as far as it goes back? And why do you think we saw this uh, huge surge in demand since that time period? <laughs> it's a great question. Depending upon what fuel we're talking about, um, we don't really have anything much before 1945 for, for fuel specific numbers, but some of them pick up and we've got more series the later you get. So if you're looking for jet fuel or distillates, you know, more comes later. In terms of why, um, 
you know, last year we, we had pretty strong demand across the board for a lot of different fuels from jet fuel to diesel fuel to, you know, here gasoline. And this is seasonal. You had a lot of people driving, you know, in December into January. Uh, it's a pretty good indicator on the consumer side in terms of activity. Now, what isn't highlighted in the executive summary, but is important is the, on the diesel fuel side or distillate side, as it's called, that's down 3.3% compared with January last year. So it is a little bit of a mixed story. That's, that is really interesting. I uh, had a rather uh, extended uh, argument, I would say, with someone about whether or not the government shutdown was going to impact gasoline demand in January. And I was curious as to what you saw. Did you see any impact in terms of gasoline demand or diesel demand? Or are we saying that the partial government shutdown really didn't have an impact on that? We can't really see that in the gasoline side of it. I mean, I, I'm sure if you were looking locally here in the DMV area, you know, between D.C., Virginia, and Maryland, yes, mm -hmm. there would be some impact. But nationwide, not so much, at least not perceptible at the fuel level. So one of the other questions that, that I was curious about that we saw in this executive summary has to do with um, the decrease in petroleum exports. And the executive summary says that this is a sign or is a sign of slowing demand. And I, I was wondering, however, what um, to what extent did you see the um, issues in Mexico, uh, you know, their um, essentially stoppage, I, I guess you could call it, of, of importing American gasoline until they fixed their, the, the people who were stealing from their, their pipelines. To what extent does that affect the numbers that we're seeing and how, how long could we see this effect kind of echoing in the demand uh, numbers and in the export numbers in, in the U.S.? No, it's a great question. That That's a pretty detailed aspect of it. And there's no doubt that some of that is probably a contributing factor. But this is a much more pervasive global issue in the sense that, well, first, for the amount that we saw exports pull back um, in January compared with both December and November, what's really important there is that it's both crude and products. And it's more on the refined product side. So gasoline, diesel being among them. But a corroborating factor here is we can look at what's happening with global shipping rates. So international shipping rates, an index of that, the Baltic Dry Index, it's a little bit inside baseball in terms of getting into economic indicators. But at between, if we compare the end of December to January, the price of shipping, that index dropped by nearly 50% in one month. You had to go back to the worst months of the financial crisis in 2008 and 9 to find a worse point. So in that sense, you have this corroboration of, you know, economic growth in China has slowed. You know, the shipping rates have, have come down significantly in one month. And now you've got really two months where U.S. exports uh, on the refined product side have pulled back pretty significantly. So that's important. And that's where we start to infer that even if U.S. demand domestically is looking pretty solid, that the economy globally and demand going with it is starting to weaken. At least that's that's the emerging trend that we're seeing. So I, that's could say that's 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 not a very particularly you know happy outlook to have <laughs> what what kind i mean how how are we going to see this kind of ripple through other numbers I mean, when is this going to start to show up do you think say in the weekly numbers or um, are we going to start to see massive builds in in product in storage in the united states <sighs> Well, I mean, the total inventories are already 5.8% above um, the average for the last five years. So the inventories are strong as they're sitting today. Now, refinery throughput, you know, taking most of that refinery, or excuse me, inventory increase has been on the crude oil side, actually, because production has been at record levels. In fact, number one in the world, again, setting yet another new record for production of both crude oil last month, as well as natural gas liquids. So, you know, almost 12 million barrels per day last month in terms of just crude oil. That's fantastic. And the refineries are turning this into something. I mean, it, the refinery utilization and throughput was a record also for the month of January. So if demand 
and the exports start to weaken, you will see the inventories begin to build. Um, you know, at this point, domestic demand's kind of been helping bail out the boat, but there's some water coming into it each month. And that's what we're looking at is it's, and it's not to tell a happy versus unhappy story. We just try to put the numbers out there and tell it like it is. Okay. We combine these data into an economic indicator. So we combine the industry fundamentals, supply and demand with some price indicators, and interest rate indicators. And that's that indicator is telling us that industrial production in the U.S. looks like it's going to slow. So that's where we are. Yeah, let's let's talk about that real quick. Um, we look at the rig count that you have. I think it was eight seventy eight rigs um, in, the, in Q four twenty eighteen, which was up from eight sixty three rigs in uh, Q three. But the rig count slipped to eight sixty six in January. One of the things we look at the rig count is historically the rig count sometimes will will really blow up um, if you look at certain segments. But then you go three, four, five years later, you go, okay, well we don't have nearly the rigs, but our production is a lot more. As we move through this year, how do we judge the rig count and production to what we did two, three, four years ago? Well, we need to continue to look at the production per rig. And if you look at EIA, under their um, drilling productivity report, there's a spreadsheet that anybody can go to their website and pull up that has their estimates for each month of how much production of oil and gas per rig per month is actually coming out from each shale production area across the United States. So that's a really important indicator of productivity. And to the extent that that's right, I mean, it, it is just their estimates and they are subject to revision. Up to this point, this last year, year and a half, we've seen some remarkable increases in productivity. And this is why we've been able to grow production with just a sliver of the rigs being active that were active, say, even four and five years ago. Now, those productivity trends are one thing. The other thing is that even if we're pulling back on drilling, we've talked the last couple of months about this backlog of drilled but uncompleted wells, which is still basically per EIA reports at record levels. So even if we get a significant pullback in drilling and we got this first bit, as you mentioned, pulling back to 866 rigs in January, um, you know, it, this backlog of wells that can be completed and the product brought to market relatively quickly is still there. So this is why despite you know, flatlining and now down drilling activity, our production as the United States of, of oil and gas is still at record levels. So even though we might say productivity, let's just say for argument's sake, productivity has peaked on, on how we can drill, which if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm following you, because you have so many ducks, the ducks in theory could kind of skew the numbers if you're not looking at the actual breakdown um, from what the rigs are able to produce versus what's going on with the ducks. If we have so many ducks that if the ducks are valuable, um, you could see these numbers continue to rise or, or stay at you know, record levels just because we have 8,600 ducks um, according to the EIA. Is that, is that kind of what you're getting at? It is, but from an EIA perspective, they are trying to separate out those pieces so they don't confound one another. And so they have the, they have an estimate looking at well-specific production data okay. that come out by, by play so that they are looking and seeing, okay, wells in the Permian look, look like, and they, they break it into subparts within the Permian, even though they only share publicly you know, an aggregate for the Permian. But they would be looking at detailed, well-specific production data to say, okay, the initial production was this, and we've got estimates then of the decline rates over time. And this tells you something about whether the productivity for that in their estimate is continuing on average for the Permian, for the Appalachian region to continue to increase or not. At this point, productivity is done great, and th th that hasn't been an issue so far. But that can only go so far. Uh, at some point, you're you're trading off the big efficiencies that have been gained over the last year or two in terms of process and drilling and optimization with the infrastructure that goes with it versus just the ability to pull forward. Um, also in the report, you have a talk about natural gas uh, liquids production. Um, does this kind of tell us what's going on with natural gas? It feels like every time folks get behind natural gas, you see a little price tick up. And then it just kind of plummets back down. Uh, I noticed, I think, uh, you know, a few months back you talked about the break-even cost of some of these dry gas plays is really low now. Um, is natural gas, from a pricing standpoint, in a healthy spot, or are the prices a little low for what producers are looking for? 
You know, there is a, a healthy spot, I guess, if you will, in the sense that per BTU analytics, the break even costs or prices for drilling dedicated gas wells at this point are between one and two dollars per million BTU, depending upon where you look. So as long as that productivity is there and that kind of cost level is there, the fact that prices are sitting a little below three dollars per million BTU means on average that most of these these areas should be able to continue to grow and prosper. Now, the challenge, of course, is you know, as you produce more, you at some point as you move up the supply curve, your costs should be rising. And it's this battle between moving to less productive geology over time versus, frankly, that productivity trend that we were just talking about on the oil side. So natural gas is going to go through that at some point. But it's interesting because as of November, we were talking about with people speculating that we might have a really cold winter, that we would, and look, coupled with the fact that we do have low inventories compared to the last seven or eight years, prices at Henry Hub had gone above $4 per million BTU. Just a couple of cold, or excuse me, um, warmer weather weeks in December were enough to bring prices down. And whereas the futures curve had said prices might come back down below $3 by April, what we've actually seen is they're already you know, in late January, early February, they've come down well below uh, $3 per million BTU. And that's, it's just a strong sign that the productivity is absolutely there. And to put it in context, the deliverability of natural gas has really never been higher. You know, we've got reports from some producers in the Marcellus or Pennsylvania shale gas region where you can drill a well you know, from spud or beginning to end in uh, just 12 days. So if, if you add another three or four days maybe to complete the well, that means in as little as just a couple of weeks, you're getting gas from just beginning the drilling process to actually flowing now toward consumers. Now that's the best case scenario where your infrastructure is in place and lined up, but that, that compares to being just measured in months, not weeks in the past. So th this is something that was impossible not long ago and it's a big change. One quick follow up on that, that and, and Ellen, I'll let you hop into this, sorry, I take up all the time here. Um, one quick follow up on that. With the prices of natural gas, they're, they're, they're lower, obviously, than, you know, well, oil prices aren't great now, but they are lower. They kind of stay low. Um, and we look at something like tariffs. How much do we try to weigh that into what's going on in the natural gas world? So, I mean, I know you guys, you can't make predictions and stuff, but, you know, the tariffs obviously have some impact on bringing in steel and, and, and prices like that. So you have a low price or a lower price environment in natural gas, and then you tack on something like tariffs. If the tariffs are, you know, or go away, Will we see maybe an increase in production on natural gas? The cost of the tariffs, to the extent it raises pipeline costs and steel costs you know, as a result, um, it, it has an impact on the margin, don't get me wrong. The bigger thing is in terms of growing exports on an LNG liquefied natural gas project level where you're spending you know, 5 and $10 billion at a time on an export project and a significant portion of your materials cost is, in fact, steel. Getting those projects to move forward, that's where you have challenges. And then on the pipeline side, part of the, the pipeline business where they've ha really ha had problems with the trade policy on steel has been less on just the cost than on the fact that there are actually quotas that South Korea, Argentina, and others have opted into. And Mexico is rumored to perhaps opt into a quota system as well. And if that happens, it can be the case where you can't buy it at any price, that basically if something hasn't been supplied so that a positive quota has been set on a, a given type of oil country tubular good, it may be just not possible to go order that good from Mexico, for example, in the future. So to the extent that your operations integrity and your ability to complete a project depends on being able to get certain materials, that's where the rubber hits the road. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, Again, it gets into the details, and the devil is in the details of the specific kinds of materials, the quality of materials, and the fit of it. Uh, the quality ends up being really important to make sure that you're, again, maintaining really high operations integrity. So I have two things to comment. One is it's interesting that you say that because um, 
putting on my historian's hat now, I spent a lot of time reading communications between uh, oil companies in the Middle East and the U.S. government in the 1940s when they were desperately, desperately trying to get higher quotas for things like pipelines and certain tubular things to can make you know to, to develop these oil resources there and after world war ii there were still serious quotas on this stuff because the united states was basically through through the marshall plan was contracted to send a certain number of it to europe a certain amount to europe to re to rebuild so uh I don't know, that discussion just just kind of reminded me of that. <laughs> I had I had one other other question for you, which is: uh, so gasoline prices are were down in January, but crude oil prices were up. Is this a holdover from the drop in prices that we saw in December, or just a factor of these uh, incredible refinery runs or product builds? What what do you see as kind of the explanation for the disconnect between gasoline prices and oil prices uh, last month? I think they're generally consistent, Ellen. You know, when you, you can't measure it to the day because, you know, frankly, just trying to calendarize it and say this month, this, there is a timing difference between when crude is purchased, when it goes into a refinery, and then when the gasoline comes out, and then how gasoline flows in terms of pricing in the different markets, it's also a function of the competitiveness of those markets. And it does, don't get me wrong, it it relates overwhelmingly. um, If you you charge up a high correlation to to crude oil prices, that's the number one cost in making gasoline. But you just can't micrometer exactly the date that it happens. And roughly, roughly, we did see a really big drop over two months a record drop since the financial crisis, actually, in, in terms of oil prices coming down. So the fact that they've come up a bit, rebounded just a little, they're still, if you're looking for the right period of time, they're still down a lot. So it, look, if they were to skyrocket back up, you know, then then you'd, you'd see some reaction to the price of the day for oil. But at this point, you've had less expensive oil generally going in the front of refineries, the refineries running flat out to produce to, to meet demand. And now, um, you know, frankly, despite that strong demand, having strong inventories, both on the product and the crude side. So look, it's a good story for consumers. Consumers are winning by virtue of the price movement that we see. We are winning. Are we, um, at one of the, the uh, points on oil that was mentioned at the State of the Union address was that the United States is, I can't remember whether it was, we are now or we are on our way to being a net exporter. Uh, Do you see this happening with the declining uh, demand for U.S. exports? Well, year to year, it's still up, even if it comes down a couple of months in a row here. And EIA would say that we're on a path where we will become an ad exporter, but it's going to take a few years to actually get there. It's not a this year thing. On the natural gas side, we are there. Um, It's really, and on for a long time, we've been a net exporter in the United States on refined products like gasoline and diesel fuel. It's the crude oil side, which last month, or excuse me, in the previous month when we went to December, was hitting a record of 2.4 million barrels per day, and that backslid by 100,000 barrels to 2.3 million barrels per day in January. So look, it's pulled back a little, and we just need to see where the global economy goes from here. If demand weakens substantially, then we get into, frankly, your bailiwick of try to look at OPEC behavior and their response in a market where the globe is, is frankly amply supplied by potential crude oil supplies. So U.S. and OPEC and Russia are then fighting for market share. And that's where it gets interesting. <laughs> that's what we like to hear. There will be a lot of people Thursday night drinking wine, having steak, and talking about this report. Uh, be sure to go and download it at the API.org we will link to it um, where you can find all the past ones in the show notes. So you can just check it out right there. But if you do happen to miss it, you can go check out API's work and Dr. Foreman's work. Dr. Foreman, we love having you on. We appreciate you having you on. And I know you're a busy guy, so thank you so much for this. Any final thoughts or anything that we didn't cover in the report that maybe you want to highlight to the listeners before we let you go? No, I think we've covered it all, and it's awesome. Thanks again for a great conversation. Thanks for coming. Okay. Thanks again to Dr. Foreman for coming on. Always enjoy getting him on. I know he's super busy, so it's good for him to squeeze a few minutes out for us. And love going over these reports. There's always, I, I like it when the data is conflicting, Ellen. I-, I don't know why. 
<laughs> but I really do like it when you have, you know, the gasoline sets a record, but the diesel's lagging. It's like, what the world is going on here? It lets us bloviate about stuff, if nothing else. Exactly. Yeah. And and it's it's interesting because there's there's always something to talk about. Like for a while it was jet fuel demand is really high. The economy is not slowing down. And now it's, you know, well, this marine indicator says we're in for global recession. Dun, dun, dun. Well, so, scary music. We'll find out. And then what we got, what Trump said March 1st, they're trying to get the China deal done. And I've heard conflicting reports. <laughs> They're gonna get that done or not, and then, you know, it's 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 all. There's always something. So conflicting reports abound. Breaking news. Exactly. Uh, well, Paul Paul Krugman has now declared that in sometime in the next few years, there's gonna be a global recession. So you know, I can't stand Paul Krugman. I mean, it says, and all the headlines say Nobel laureate says this. Like, oh gracious. Well, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, all right. Well, Ellen, this week. Other than reading your statistical report on Valentine's Day, where will you be? Well, I will be on Forbes. Uh, I think I'm going to be talking more about batteries, fun, fun batteries. Uh, I'm also going to be actually in D.C. I'm going to be at a conference that the Atlantic Council is uh, putting on about uh, the 40th anniversary of Iran's revolution, uh, which is an area of particular interest of mine. I think we we talk quite a bit about Iran here, so I'm going to be uh, there, and I'll probably be tweeting about it, you know, excessively, so uh, follow me. Uh, if you're interested in uh, thinking about what what's happened to Iran in 40 years since its revolution, I had no idea that you like that Middle East stuff. That's really, really a surprise for me. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. You are the resident scholar for a reason. Um, yeah, text oil gas podcast, Robbie, and we have a new oil and gas show coming out. We haven't released it publicly. Uh, not going to be news based. It's a little something different. So. Um, those will be coming out soon. We have some details and we have a project we're working on the background. Hopefully we can announce, uh, Ellen here. I got to take, 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 update you about that offline as well. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> for the listeners, it's so exciting. hopefully we can, yes, if we get that done, that would be awesome. So we are working on that. Um, I guess that's it, Ellen. I guess that's it, right? Yep. Well, keep in, keep, keep abreast of everything. There's a lot going on in, in oil this week. I, I think we're going to, we're going to see something happening in Venezuela sooner rather than later. I think either it's, it's, it's going to go one way or the other, and that's going to have an impact on, on uh, gasoline supplies and, and oil supplies. So everyone should keep an eye, close eye on that. And we will talk to you next week.